This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making for Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore. Welcome to episode 35 of the Rational Reminder Podcast. Yeah, what a great guest we had today. Yeah, today we had Lindsay Plum join us for a, a podcast. Lindsay is a fee only advisor, I guess, a money coach might be a, a better term for it, out in Victoria. BC. The story of how I found Lindsay is actually kind of funny. I'm part of this Globe and Mail. Well, actually, I've deactivated my Facebook account, so I'm not part of any Facebook groups at the moment. But when, when my Facebook was active, I was part of the Globe and Mail Gen Y Money Facebook group because I write the Globe and Mail Gen Y Money column. And one day, Lindsay commented on, I don't know if it was on something that I'd written or whatever. She posted a comment basically saying, you guys should come join my Facebook group. It's got way more members than this and it was hilarious. So she poached or tried to poach members from the group and I was like, oh. So I went and checked her Facebook group out and it's, it's true. She has like 6,000 people in there. Wow, really? And it's the the amount of, the volume of conversation is, is insane. So it's got a ton of active members. Anyway, it's a neat little group. So that's how I found Lindsay and she, we wanted to have somebody on to talk about spending and budgeting because that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum of what we talk about. We usually assume people already have wealth, but that's not always the case. And even if you do, spending and budgeting is still super important. So anyway. That's what I found the biggest takeaway for me was this applies to everyone. Just getting alignment on your values and what you spend money on, that affects everybody, no matter how much assets you might have. Yeah. And that's what her message comes down to is that you've got to have with your spouse and also with yourself, you have to have an understanding and alignment of what your values are and what your goals are. And that should inform your financial decisions. That's basically the message. Absolutely. She was terrific. Have a good listen. Yeah, she was a good guest. All right. So, Lindsay, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. So, before we jump into the questions, can you just give us a little bit of your background and what you do within your business? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to. So, my background, I started as a licensed advisor back in 2008 and found myself really being drawn to working with middle income families, busy moms. And through that process, got to see really clearly the challenges that were stopping people from even realizing that there's a world of investing to tap into and to, and to learn. So I really, you know, like I say, found myself leaning that way. And then in 2015, I started a independent financial planning firm with my husband. I also started a, a Facebook group and now have taken that into be an online coaching community for women. And yeah, so I spend all my time working with busy moms and breaking down the day to day stuff that isn't often addressed in financial planning conversations because they're very different skill sets. Yeah, I agree. And I'll be the first one to admit that budgeting is really hard. I'm personally not great at it. I I usually end up working backwards by saving the amount that I know I want to save and just kind of figuring out the the budgeting and the spending on the back end, which can sometimes be a little bit uh, stressful. So why is budgeting so hard? That's such a great question. I think budgeting is so hard because quite, off, quite honestly, most people aren't doing it, what I would say, right. You know, they're writing some numbers down on paper and calling it a budget. There's a lot of background work that I do with my clients to figure out where the leaks in the bucket are. You know, where is their money actually going? How much is going into these different areas? And why are we going to go through this process in the first place? You know, things like identifying our goals and more importantly, identifying our values. You know, and it's it's very difficult for people to stay on budget if they haven't done those things. And so like I say, I think that people just are not taking the time to, to do that work when they're creating a budget. We don't get taught how to create a budget. And a lot of people feel like budgeting is really restrictive and not fun <laughs> at all. So I think that, you know, those things combined really cause people to not be good at budgeting and have a really hard time with it. That is so interesting. So you're getting people to discover their values, therefore enabling them to articulate their goals 
which I assume then must change people's relationship with their money. Is that a safe statement? Absolutely. When we realize that as, you know, as parents, for example, that we really want to provide, you know, a great experience for our kids. And that by doing that doesn't mean buying them every toy they want, buying them every, you know, the new backpack and the new video game that they want, that those actions are in a lot of cases completely misaligned with our true values. It's a lot easier to say no to those purchases next time when we identify what we really want. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. Now, I've, I've tried budgeting apps like Mint, YNAB. My bank has a, a budgeting app now. And again, I don't find them to be particularly useful because it's, it's still hard to follow and, and stick with. So uh, what I want to ask is what does work in terms of actually using a tool that, that's going to allow you to stick to a budget? Yeah. So there's a lot of tools nowadays. I just found a, a new one that does it all through Facebook Messenger. I mean, we're getting pretty, pretty high tech with this stuff these days. And if we are expecting an app or any of these tools to do it for us, then we're probably not going to be successful. Um, if we're expecting to use an app that tracks our spending, but not necessarily plans it before it happens, then we're probably not going to find success with anything more than tracking spending. So yeah, there's a lot of different programs and I don't necessarily believe in one or the other. You know, I have some clients who love pen and paper. I love a good Excel spreadsheet. I think that it's one of the simplest forms of budgeting, you know, tools that are out there right now. And yeah, just finding the one that, that works for you. I mean, it's great when it connects to your bank account. However, there's only so many times you can handle reconnecting your bank account because the connection has been lost somewhere along the lines before you throw the baby out with the bathwater. So getting really clear on what features you're looking for. Do you want it to connect to your spouse? Do you want it to connect to your bank account? How, you know, is this a tool meant for tracking or is it a tool meant for budgeting? And, you know, back to your, your first question, Ben, another reason why people are having a really hard time with budgeting is because they don't understand the difference between tracking and budgeting. Right. One's forecasting, right? One's one direction and one's the other direction. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good answer to the question. But it's easy to say, you know, find an app that works for you. But is that really the real root of the problem that people often face? It strikes me that we're really talking about motivation. Like someone has to be really motivated to make a change, correct? Agreed. Yeah. It's absolutely not about the app. I mean, for my my clients and my my course community, I give them a budget in three different forms. I have a website, I have a fillable PDF, and I have an Excel spreadsheet. And I also go and review different apps with them to help them find something that works for them. But first, we have to figure out, like I say, what is a budget? Where are our values? And quite often, that's happening through conversation, through pen and paper, through Excel. It's the simple form before taking on something else in my experience anyways yeah no I mean it makes it, it makes logical sense though now assuming someone has figured out what their values are and they have put together a budget what is the one category if there is one that you most commonly see people blowing up their budget with food hands down yeah. I tell people all the time you're eating your goals it's always food wow. <laughs> it is like always dining out. Food. All of it. Grocery stores. It's really hard to pop into the grocery store for cream. You spend 50 bucks. I don't know what happens. Something just magical happens in those places. And one of the things that I that I have my my students do is visualizing the marketing executive sitting around the boardroom table, you know, putting their hands together like what's his name from from The Simpsons? Mr. Burns. <laughs> Mr. Burns, yes. And that that is what they're doing to get their hand in your pocket. That is what the cap ends of the of the aisles are doing. They're catching your attention. And that's why it's almost impossible to just go in and get your $3 cream and without spending, you know, 20, 30, 40, $50. So yeah, food, the takeout, the eating out, the Costco. <laughs> I love a good Costco shop, but hard to get out of there for less than three, four, five hundred dollars $500. So in all, you know, all senses of it, it's absolutely food is the biggest killer to our, our budgets. So how do you coach people to fix that? 
just ignored the ends of the aisles? How do you change that behavior? So, I mean, the simplest thing that people can do, um, especially for working professionals whose time is sometimes even more valuable than the money, don't go into that store more, more than once a week. Take half an hour, write down a list and either do an online order or go into the store, get your list and don't go back because you don't, you can't afford the time quite honestly is, is how it's going these days. And that will save people hundreds of dollars a month. You know, we quite often, it's somewhere between 200 up to $1,000. I just did, I just worked with a client last night. And just through this tiny little technique of, you know, being a little bit more mindful, more mindful, sorry, and, and planning a little bit more, their food budget overall grows grocery eating out and booze went down $1,200. I believe it. I love going to the grocery store and, and it's always expensive. Yeah, no, I, I get it. That, that makes a lot of sense. Other than spending or, or, or curtailing spending on on food, what what's the highest impact spending fix that you can think of other than food? So other than food, well, on the topic of food, doing an online order is absolutely by far the best because it keeps you out of the store. But quite honestly, it, you know, it's 2019. People love to shop and we have things all over the place just wanting our money. That's why I like to think of the, uh, the marketing executives. So staying out of the malls is staying out of the stores. If you work anywhere near a mall, if you work downtown, it is so important to stay away. That is by far, I mean, it's, it's so simple. And that goes along also with, you know, some of the other things I mentioned, like getting really clear on what your, what your values are, but we are not very good at impulse or controlling our impulses nowadays. We've, we've kind of started to lose that ability. And if those impulses, you know, if those purchases are easy for you and you don't have impulse control, then you're going to make all sorts of purchases that are not aligned with your goals and spend money on, you know, the shoes that just went on sale instead of that family vacation or whatever the case may be. It's so true. And all of the, the companies that are selling stuff are so good at selling us stuff. So it is not only are we bad at avoiding impulse spending, the, the companies are good at forcing us to do impulse spending. Absolutely. And it's online now too, right? Hide the ads on your Facebook news feed. Unsubscribe from the mailing list. All of take your credit card out of your browser history so you can't make those find a way to make it more difficult to make purchasing decisions. And imagine it's hard for us. Can you imagine for our children? So how do you advise your clients to coach their kids? To modify their behavior. Yeah. So I talk to my clients a lot about, about how to deal with kids and money. And I really want kids to know that money is a tool and that it's in abundance. And just because they're, it might not feel or maybe there just is not very much money right now, it has nothing to do with what's possible. And so I'm coaching parents a lot on their language with their kids. It's not that you can't afford something. It's absolutely not that you can't afford something. It's that we're using our money for something else. And getting our kids to realize that we are planning with our money because they don't see, they don't see it, right? They just see the card come out. And quite honestly, for a lot of people, you know, the, if the machine says approved, then they call that, you know, affordable or it's budgeted for. So yeah, the kids are not, are not getting the skills because of that. And so having those conversations, if we're not going to do that right now, because of this, we're going to, we're doing this tomorrow, we're doing this next month and being really careful that it's not about, we can't afford it, but that we are absolutely saying no to them. So you're teaching them about choices. That's really smart. I like that a lot. That's something that I'll, uh, I'll start using with my own, my own kids. I hadn't thought about just having that conversation about we're not going to do this because we just did this or because we were going to do this. I, I, I really like that. Now, again, on, on the topic of kids, allowance, are you a fan of allowance or not? And if, if you do like it, how do you recommend implementing it? Yeah, there's a great divide on, on, that, on that topic. You know, some people believe that family money is family money and we should, you know, be allowed to use it just because we're in the family and other families feel that the kids really need to earn it. And I think it, really depends on your family and your kids' personalities. If you don't have a child that is, you know, motivated by money, I mean, mine is not 
at all. It doesn't work that well. However, if he wants something, my kid plays baseball. He's seven years old and he he loves bat catcher, that position. However, at seven, you don't have positions yet. You still play everything. But he wants bat catcher gear so badly that I can use that as a motivator if I want him to do his chores but I can't offer him five bucks. Five bucks is not going to do it, but $5 towards that back catcher's gear will get him off the couch and into action. So it's important to know, you know, what's important for our kids, for anybody that's read five love languages, like speaking in somebody else's language goes the same way with money. And so I don't, I don't think that, you know, allowance is good or bad. And however, I do really feel like kids should have an opportunity to participate in, you know, the family economy one way or another. And it's important to know where their motivation lies. One thing that we did, we just got back from vacation and uh, we were down in Mexico and our kids got 50 pesos a day each and 50 pesos a day right now is about three and a half dollars but it feels like a lot to them right 50 wow that's a big number and we didn't put restrictions on what they could use it for they could use it for whatever they wanted they could save it up they can buy candy from you know the kid on the corner whatever they wanted to do with that money and so giving them opportunities that they don't get at home because I can't give them 50 bucks a day and you can't buy anything for three and a half dollars here so really allowing them to participate participate when the opportunities are available. I got a question for you regarding couples. So we have a lot of couples that that have come to us and they say like, how should we do our banking? Should we keep separate bank accounts? We merge our accounts. We're married. We're not married. We're common law, whatever the situation might be. So my first question is, do you have basic advice on that? And secondly, if you have a couple where the income levels are a lot different between the two people, how do you manage that fairly? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's different than it used to be, right? So in terms of, you know, how to do bank accounts and whether or not they should be joint is, of course, going to be hugely dependent on your personalities and your relationship and, and, you know, backgrounds and comfort levels. However, I know that it's a lot easier to manage something when we have it all in the same place. So for managing household finances, it's a lot easier for it to be in the same place. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be in the same bank account. So if you want to have separate bank accounts, maybe you need to be using Quicken or, you know, an Excel spreadsheet to keep track of things. And for some couples, that keeping track would feel extremely nitpicking and really feeling like they're, you know, being nickel and dimed and, and it would feel like the opposite of equality. And for other couples, that's hugely important based on where they're at, you know, in their careers and what they're coming into this relationship with. So I think that, you know, in terms of joint bank accounts and whatnot, you got to do what works for you. But the planning and the organization has to be done together. Unless you have figured out how to, you know, run your household and you each do your own grocery shopping and you each do your own laundry and you each do your own cooking cooking, then why would you each do your own finances? You've created a life together. And if you want to make chili together, you both have to be in the kitchen talking about the ingredients. So that's the most important thing is making sure that there is planning that both people are involved in. And when it's all roses and everything's all in one bank account, still the planning needs to be there. And I need to know how much I can afford to spend without raising any concerns or, you know, screwing up the plan. So if that's going to be 500 bucks a month, I want to be able to spend that 500 bucks a month on whatever I want. I don't care if you don't think that I should spend it on a pedicure. I'm going to go spend it on a pedicure. And if you want to go and buy a drone, go and buy a drone. You might not agree with me. I might not (laughs) agree with you, but that's my prerogative as an adult to make that choice. It can be really, especially for new relationships where people are coming in either with lots of student loan debt 
or already in high paying careers, it can be a hard one to navigate and not hard. It just takes, it just takes conversation and time, just like all those other big topics that, you know, need to be discussed. When there's the, the discrepancy, again, it really depends on, on the relationship. I mean, if one partner is out earning tenfold the other partner, but maybe the lower income partner is at home with kids, you know, to say, this is my money. Well, then who's kids are they? Are they her kids because the money's his or vice versa? It doesn't work like that when you're creating a life together. So getting really clear on how is this going to work? So for some people, we're going to do all of the money into one bank account. For some people, it's going to be two bank accounts and an Excel spreadsheet. But more than anything, it needs to work for both parties. Um, The higher income earner, it really does not work for them to hoard the money or for them to have full control. That will rear its ugly head, you know, somewhere down the line in the relationship. So yeah, a long-winded answer to not really give you an answer. It's so dependent but communication and planning is is uh, the one thing that is a must. Your, your comment about having sort of a family budget and then a discretionary amount for each partner in the relationship, that's just by our own problem solving and, and discussions. That's what my wife and I, my wife is at home with kids right now. But we ended up doing exactly that, where we have our family budget to achieve our family goals. And then we each allocate an amount where either of us can spend that on whatever we want each month. Yeah, I call it your lifestyle spending. And for those, I even have my clients, you know, have their own accounts. I don't need somebody, you know, noticing that I went out for lunch today when they log into their bank account and asking me why I decided (laughs) to spend, you know, 100 bucks at lunch. If I got the 100 bucks, I'm going to spend it. And that's, you know, know, where people can feel really restricted around budgeting. And quite often, I think it's because we've, you know, we've budgeted down to the very last dollar, and there's no freedom. And that's not very fun. (laughs) So we need to have some freedom, if we expect it to work. So I've got a question from a bit of a different angle. And I don't know how often you see this, but it's something that we see every now and then when somebody has sudden wealth, like we've been talking about budgeting and saving and all that kind of stuff. If somebody has an inheritance, or they win the lottery, I guess, in an extreme case, but they they suddenly have wealth. Do you have any thoughts on how that can affect someone's relationship with money and the best ways to approach that? Mm, What a great question. I mean, we know the the stats of when people win the lottery, what happens, you know, in the next one, two, three years. So what I will often tell people, you know, these things are very rarely overnight sensations and inheritance. Either we have a family member who is, you know, falling ill or aging, and we know something might be coming at some point, or we're dealing with the estate and probate and all that sort of good stuff. You know, when you win the lottery, you don't get the money that day or an insurance payout. You know, you have a car accident, it's months before the money comes. So I'm often talking to people about, you know, if they're in those situations, we need to plan for the money before it's in our hands. And in, you know, for most people, they don't need the money for their day to day stuff unless it's a insurance payout because they can't go to work. But for most people, it doesn't need to be absorbed into day to day spending. They're going to keep doing their life the same way they did their life before on a month to month basis. They might vacation more, they might get a new car, a new house, they might retire earlier. But I really encourage people to not not it's it's the same as as uh, not going to the mall like don't give yourself the opportunity for it to affect your relationship with money because for most people their finances i mean you guys know dealing you know on the on the investment side talking to people about about investment goals most people don't have as much invested as they would like most people don't have their mortgages paid off so if you have a a windfall of some sort those are generally the areas that i see the best results of using, you know, those lump sums and have it not affect your your day to day. That's a really uh, good way to think about like it. Like I say, insurance or something that you need it to replace some income. So it's kind of like achieving financial goals that you already had and and not materially changing lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, you're going from point A to point B, and you were driving a Mazda. Now you're driving a Ferrari, but the goal didn't change, and we don't need to change the route even. We're still just going to go from point A to point B, which is why it's important 
to a have a plan, both a budget for day to day, as well as a financial plan for long term, and understand where your values lie, because it is really easy to just start spending when the money is there. And that also goes for people who are getting raises promotions, new jobs, you know, mom or dad that's taken uh, mat leave or parental leave, and their income is lower. And now they're going back to work and they're having this influx again, you know, making sure that the plan is in place first, so that we know what path to walk down to reach our destination. I'm curious how your advice changes to someone who might be retired. Let's think of someone who may have more than enough assets in retirement. Do you help them realize like philanthropic goals they might have or legacy goals to their family? It's a great topic because it's one that, you know, a lot of people don't think about until they're there. And, you know, I, I often find myself sounding like a like a broken record. But again, back to the, the goals and values, you know, how are we spending our money and what's important to us? You know, what's important to one person who you know, maybe retired as a chef and made huge headways in in the, uh, you know, cuisine world and whatnot, they would probably want to dine at different restaurants than I want to dine at. And they worked their whole life hard and, you know, put in their time. So why shouldn't they be allowed to go and, and spend the money there? One person would call that frivolous. But if that's where they spent their life and, you know, the area they contributed to, um, that's really where they're going to get the fulfillment and probably have a happier and therefore a longer, healthier life. So the values is so such an important part. And I quite often will ask people, you know, retirees with healthy incomes, with healthy retirement accounts, uh, investment accounts, whatever that might be, to look at their values. Nine times out of 10 has to do with family, if they have family, and look at ways that they can better their life because it is expensive nowadays, you know, to buy houses and raise kids. And where could they help their their kids and grandkids without just, you know, signing a check? Because again, that goes back to the whole windfall thing, right? So the values is just such an important piece that I find when people are creating their own budget, they're almost never talking about. And when they're sitting down with a financial planner, they're also not very often talking about because there's so many other pieces that have to be talked about in that room that can't be talked about elsewhere. So I think it's a piece that a lot of people are are really missing. And, you know, I mean, look at at uh, what's her name, Marie Kondo, and the craze about decluttering right now. Well, it's because all that stuff in your house wasn't aligned with your values in the first place. Uh, it's an interesting you point. Go. You're exactly right. What do you think about somebody in the opposite situation? So instead of somebody that's got enough assets to retire and enough income to retire, what if somebody, maybe they do have a high income, but they're 50, 55 years old and they've got nothing saved. Do you have any experience helping people in a situation like that? Yes. Now, let me just have a think here quite often. I mean, if somebody's in that position, their, you know, their, their, uh, their habits and ways are so ingrained that it's, it's a much bigger shift than say a young, a young family, right. That is just kind of learning how they want to create their lives together. And again, looking at the values quite often, the conversation will, will be, well, if we don't make these changes, what's going to happen? So I'll have my clients choose a, a this or that statement. I can have this or I can have that. I can keep spending this way right now, or I can retire at 65. Because unless something changes in terms of the amount of the number of dollars available, it really is that choice. I can have this or I can have that. And when we put it that way to ourselves, it's a lot easier to say no to stuff that we might otherwise be spending on. So when we're looking at a shorter runway, you know, somebody in their 50s who really needs to buckle down and start saving and investing for those retirement years to get them all the way through, it's this or that. I can go out for dinner now or I can retire and not be in a, you know, government funded facility. Right. You know, kind of just a, a re reality check to say, like, this is not going to end well unless you change something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we need to give ourselves those reality checks because the the ostrich effect and just putting our head in the sand and pretending that retirement's not coming, <laughs> pretending that it doesn't cost 
several thousands of dollars just to put a basic roof over our heads. It's, it's the easy thing to do, but it's not the right thing to do if we want our goals to happen. Great answer. Thanks for that. We ask all of our guests this last question. And like all of our guests, you are clearly on a mission to help people. So we're really curious to know, how do you define success in your life? In my life or for my clients? In your own life. life, Oh, in my own life. Yeah. I, you know, when I feel the most successful is when I get a Facebook message telling me that somebody took one of my programs or is using one of my templates or has been following me on Facebook and took some of my advice and that it made a difference for them. You know, some days I'm so, you know, just so lucky, so blessed to to wake up to those messages saying that template changed my life. And so that's when I feel, that's when I feel successful. It's actually super interesting because for Cameron and I, the, the stuff that we do and the things that we help people with, it has a, an important long-term outcome on their lives. But the stuff that you're doing, it has like an immediate profound impact, totally different. Like we don't, we, we don't, that type of fulfillment that you're talking about, we don't necessarily get that from clients because what we do, it's over 50 years that they'll see the outcome. Yes, exactly. Yes. And that's how I define it to people that, you know, planners, advisors, portfolio managers, it's all a long runway. It's all a big picture plan with lots of pieces involved that can get fairly technical. And my job is to help with the day-to-day stuff. And and like you say, we can have such a profound difference just by doing an online grocery store shop instead of going in. <laughs> yeah, no, that's interesting. All right. Well, Lindsay, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to be on the podcast. I've yeah, loved being treat. here. It was a treat to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks so much for having me.